All right, then, all yours. Uh, I think I'm good here. Yeah, uh, looks good. Uh, all right, uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Martin Brown. Uh, the introduction was pretty much spot on, uh, no worries there. So uh, this talk today is titled Android Complexity. And the basic idea behind this talk was that I just wanted to rant a bit about uh, all of the things that we're supposed to care about when we're developing Android apps. Uh, we have this huge uh, feature-rich platform, but this also means that we have all of these things that we're supposed to be doing, uh, and it gets quite tiring and complex and just overwhelming at times. So I wanted to talk a bit, a bit about this. Um, now, to give this um, some kind of context and some kind of um, motivation and uh, learning opportunity, uh, at the end of this, uh, I tried framing this talk uh, into something other than just a rant. Uh, so the pitch here is going to be that if you have some existing product and existing application, then you might be able to pick, pick up some of these ideas and focus on them to polish your uh, application further. Or alternatively, uh, you can create a checklist of sorts uh, based on this and then your own inputs, of course, uh, which will help you better plan your next project uh, so that you can uh, figure out uh, before you get started uh, which things you're going to implement, which things you're going to care about, and what you're going to omit for the given um, Android app. So with that, uh, let's jump straight into it. I'm going to go quite quickly, and I'll only really just touch on the um, very um, wide topics here. We're not going to go into any depth on any of these, um, as this is a lightning talk after all. So the first uh, loose grouping uh, is going to be UX, uh, so things related to user experience. And I'm going to kick off with accessibility first. So you have definitely uh, seen at least some of uh, working with accessibility in Android Studio, and because you must have seen this kind of warning before. So this is the very basic support that you can add for accessibility, adding descriptions to images and things like that. Uh, but there are actually very rich and very uh, complicated APIs for uh, properly supporting accessibility of various kinds in your application. So if you want to go all out and um, be friendly to all possible users, then you should consider all of those. Uh, one of my pet peeves that I want to highlight in this category is tap targets. So even if your design includes very small icons or very small buttons, then um, the tap targets don't actually have to be the same. So you should be padding those icons so that they're easier to hit. And this uh, even matters for uh, users who otherwise have fine motor control. But let's say they're on public transportation and things are shaking around. Um, they're also going to have a harder time uh, hitting those very precise uh, small little tap targets. Um, so you know, uh, accessibility actually improves your app for everyone, and not just someone who has uh, some kind of specific um, problem with accessibility in general. Uh, so yeah, um, for basic things, uh, please follow Android Studio's advice, uh, some of those basic hints there, and also read the material design guidelines, uh, because they can make your app a lot more accessible if you just follow those as you can. Uh, on the topic of making your app um, available to more users, uh, you can go down the route of internationalization and localization. Uh, so at the very basic, again, uh, you can uh, use string resources for everything in your app so that you can make sure that you're going to be able to translate them. Then there's things like date formats, which will vary uh, differ um, in different regions. Uh, kind of similar to date formats, there's the start of the week, which again is uh, sometimes Sunday, sometimes Monday, uh, sometimes other things uh, based on uh, where your app is being used. So you should think about users um, in that regard as well. And then there's also right to left support, which is going to come up with uh, certain languages if you're uh, publishing your app to those regions. And, but also, uh, you don't just have to uh, take care of this when it comes to strings, but your entire layout should uh, support right to left. And a lot of navigation patterns, transitions, uh, back navigation, and things like that should uh, happen the other way around as what you're used to. So that's, again, something that you should test in your app and make sure you're not hard coding things. Uh, that should be in a different way in those um, locals. One of my uh, favorite things uh, when it comes to localization is plurals, uh, which is a special resource type for string resources. Uh, so this uh, serves as a way of um, supporting 
different spellings of um, quantities of items. So for example, in English, we have spe special uh, spelling for just a single item um, because we use the singular noun after that. Uh, but for any other quantity of items in English, uh, we would say songs, uh, so the uh, plural um, variant of the noun. Um, and so you can do this by using these uh, plural resources and using the quantity attributes specifically. And this is just for English, one and then all other numbers. But there are languages uh, with a whole bunch of different concepts with special handling for zero, one, two, a few values uh, even. So uh, this gets complex again. Um, but depending on how many languages uh, you have to support, you should probably look into this uh, if you're displaying stuff like that on your UI. Then there's animations. So here you have the base problem of figuring out what animations to add. So hopefully you have a designer for this um, who figures this out for you um, and makes sure that animations are not annoying and users are not just uh, waiting for animations to go away so that they can use your app, but they're useful, delightful. They're leading them through the app, um, getting them into the correct flows and things like that. Uh, but after you've figured out what kind of animation you want in your app, you're going to have a uh, new problem, which is figuring out how to implement it. So I think this is the story of animations on Android uh, since, well, forever. Um, so we have so many uh, animation APIs, um, as uh, summarized by this quick Twitter exchange, that it re it's really a, a struggle to uh, choose the correct one to use. So what you would do is you would go onto Google, and you would find articles like this, uh, which is an Android animation API cheat sheet. And then you would open it up and find uh, this kind of image in there, which you know um, isn't um, exactly um, like a relaxing thing to find. Uh, so you have all of these choices to make, all of these APIs that you can land on. Uh, you're kind of supposed to be familiar with these and be able to use them. Uh, so again, just a lot to take in. Uh, we can like quickly zoom through this. Uh, you can see that there's so much um, to cover here. Uh, the good news, kind of, is that uh, this flowchart is actually from a talk from Dev Summit two years ago. So if you go ahead and listen to that talk and watch that talk, then you're going to have a good overview of all the different animation approaches and why you should use them in different places, going all the way from the very classic old Android APIs all the way up to motion layout, which is uh, still kind of the hot new thing. Uh, one of my pet peeves, uh, yet again, with animations is that you can disable animations on a Android device. So even if you have something as simple as this uh, loading screen with just a progress bar in the middle, if you launch this screen on a device that has animations disabled, you might be surprised to find something like this in the place of the progress bar. So you would get this uh, kind of a static uh, refresh icon looking thing. Um, and you might wonder for a while uh, how this ended up as part of your layout. So this is actually just the uh, non-animated version of a progress bar. So the takeaway here is that users might have animations disabled uh, for accessibility reasons, or some people just um, feel like their phone is faster if there's no animation. So uh, people even tend to do that. Um, so test your app sometimes with animations disabled. Uh, make sure that everything still uh, looks all right. Uh, moving on to uh, dark theme. Uh, this is a platform supported thing now. Uh, so uh, users will probably have an expectation that you're going to support it nicely. Uh, in the latest versions, uh, you can follow the system level setting if you want, but you can also offer a choice within your application, uh, whether you want to follow the system setting, whether you want light or dark mode explicitly. I think even Google recommends that you uh, give this kind of choice to your users. And you can also do things like uh, follow the uh, battery saver status so that if the user has battery saving on, then you can go to the dark mode and uh, conserve some energy um, by just uh, using less for the screen. And again, this is just for the very latest versions. So if you want to go back to versions where we didn't have system-wide support, you can also implement dark theme, but you have to make sure that you're doing it appropriately for every given version. Let's do some platform things. So under the platform category, I want to list some very Android things um, that we have to take care of, starting with restoring state. So uh, this is a very classic thing that you kind of learn as a beginner. Um, so when you're going through configuration changes, for example, uh, you rotate the, rotate the screen, your activity is going to be torn down and recreated, and you have to deal with uh, not losing data and UI state uh, when that happens. So that would be an orientation change. But there are a whole bunch of other configuration changes that can, hap that can happen even if you lock your screen to portrait mode in the app, for example. So changing, um, toggling dark mode, changing languages, changing the font size, all of these will uh, recreate your activity. So you really should be able to handle this. 
Plus, of course, um, there's the even larger uh, picture. Uh, your process can die if you're in the background and there's not enough memory for it uh, to be kept around. So you should all also handle process death. And uh, for this, you have to persist things in saved instance state and mechanisms uh, like that. And you should also, again, test for this and make sure that your app can come back from that um, like um, gracefully. A very classic thing on Android is the huge variety of hardware that we face. So uh, we have screens with different physical sizes with different resolutions. And these, of course, uh, are going to yield different screen densities as well. Uh, so we're used to shipping assets in all of these different sizes so that can, they can be used um, as needed. And nowadays, you can get away with vector throwables for a lot of things. But and there are still some images where you're going to have to ship different resolutions or uh, find a solution like that. Uh, app bundles hopefully help with reducing APK sizes um, in this case. But since all of that uh, screen uh, variance and complexity wasn't enough for us, hardware makers graced us with the wonderful uh, invention that's notches. So now we have this beautiful thing on the top of devices occasionally, and we have APIs for querying where those are so that we can make sure that we're not drawing content under them. So you know that's yet another thing that you're supposed to deal with uh, because users are going to have devices like this. And we are also getting folding phones now. So uh, you can also query where these folds happen, uh, how much a device is folded, um, and what's happening with that. And if you want to provide a really, really nice experience, uh, such as the example you can see on the slide here, uh, then you can even adapt your UI dynamically as the device is being folded. Um, OK. So that's all the hardware options for screens. But users can also change things at the software level. So for example, they can adjust font size or display size, uh, which you uh, should be able to handle in your app. So looking at different font sizes uh, on an example screen here, uh, if you're using SPs as your uh, font size um, dimensions, uh, then you're going to get this uh, to work automatically. Uh, so if you look at these screenshots, you can see that the paragraph on the bottom is uh, being scaled up nicely. Uh, also, the entire UI is shifting around just a little bit as the title uh, that's on the top is uh, increasing in size. On the other hand, changing display size will scale up all of your UI. You can see that text is um, being enlarged here as well, but not to the same amount as with uh, font size changes. Uh, but also everything else on the UI, the icons in the middle, um, the uh, image up top, as well as the toolbar even, are also scaling up and down with display size. So you also kind of have to. Um, sometimes um, put your devices into these odd configurations, try, config try uh, combinations of font sizes and display sizes, and make sure that your app looks reasonable. A quick mention to app shortcuts, which are uh, kind of underused, I think. Uh, so these enable you to put uh, certain actions into your launcher uh, when um, users long press on your app. So for example, with Maps, uh, it can offer uh, quick navigation to work or home. These are kind of static shortcuts there. But you can also make this very dynamic based on the usage of the app. So for example, Spotify can offer you your uh, most recently uh, listened to playlists so that you can quickly get back to those. So again, something to consider supporting uh, if you have data and meaningful things that you can launch quickly uh, like this. Going on to notifications, I think every Android developer loves these uh, because they get some kind of uh, overhaul and changes in every version. So whenever you add notifications to an app, you're going to have to go through each major version every once in a while and just make sure that everything still looks all right. Um, you can customize notifications a fair bunch. Um, you can um, place uh, large amounts of text in them, uh, some rich content like images in them. If you're a messaging or media application, uh, then you get even more um, special styles of notifications. So for a media app, you can have playback controls there and uh, album artwork. If you're a messaging app, you can have inline replies and uh, reply suggestions and all of those kinds of things. While we're here, um, make sure that you are using notification channels reasonably. Um, so uh, there are still some apps that just have a single notification channel and send everything through that so the user doesn't have much of a chance to customize their notifications. I chose not to shame them today, so I didn't include screenshots of examples of this. Uh, but instead, I included two good examples uh, where you can see that there's very granular control over uh, what notifications the user is going to receive uh, so that they can set different um, levels of notifications or uh, turn them off entirely. 
Then, of course, Android is not just on phones, uh, so you can uh, go beyond phones. Um, if you're a fitness app, you might want to consider having a Vero as application. If you're a media app or you're a game, you might want to live on Android TV as well. Uh, even if you don't want a dedicated app for Android TV and you're dealing with media, you can add casting support to your applications uh, so that you can at least uh, share your content to the TV easily. And you can also uh, go on the road with Android, of course, uh, with Android Auto. So if you're a media playback app or a messaging app, then you can also um, have your app appear um, on the screens right next to the wheel. So, um, you know, uh, the basic integration, especially for media apps, is quite straightforward. So if you're using media session APIs and things like that correctly, then you can actually get started with like five lines of XML code or something like that. Um, but proper support is, of course, going to be more complex. Then let's talk a bit about inputs. So we would assume that most of the time our users are going to have phones in their hands and using the touch screen. But since this is Android, you know that you're going to have some users that uh, have setups like this, right? Uh, so Android has always had uh, awesome support for keyboards and mice, uh, USB, Bluetooth, whatever you want. Um, so there are going to be some users who do uh, things like this. If you're a productivity application, then it's a good, good idea to um, make sure that uh, power users uh, can have, for example, keyboard shortcuts or reasonable navigation with arrow keys around the UI and things like that. And of course, if you're a game, you should think about controllers uh, because people love to do that as well. All right, uh, let's talk a bit about QA, uh, both on the uh, development side and then uh, the user-facing side. So uh, static analysis is something you get by default if you're using Android Studio, which is great. Uh, you get all of IntelliJ's inspections uh, for Java and Kotlin language features, uh, making sure that you're using them correctly. And you also get Android Lint for Android SDK-specific um, warnings and errors. You can also customize these. You can also go to third-party tools, uh, KTLint, uh, for example, or Detect, or uh, even Sonar, um, if you're uh, doing this in a um, larger group setting. Uh, but the point is, uh, you should uh, have some kind of static analysis set up, probably, for code quality. And at the very least, just heed the default warnings that are there in the ID for you. Then there's unit testing. Uh, this seems simple at first because you can run them on your local development machine. Uh, they execute quickly. You need some basic knowledge of JUnit, uh, but that's really all of it. But then it co comes to all of the dependencies that go with unit testing. So all of the mocking libraries, uh, the discussions on whether you should be mocking or faking things, uh, all of the assertion libraries uh, that you can then use at the end of your tests. Uh, so again, this is a lot to take in as well. And then UI tests are kind of more of the same. They have all of these uh, discussions and topics, but they also need you to be running on uh, some kind of a device, uh, whether that's um, an actual physical device or an emulator or somewhere in the cloud. Um, and also, you have to learn uh, how Espresso works with view measures and all of that. Uh, performance profiling uh, up next. So you can do basic performance profiling, uh, and actually quite a bit of it uh, now, uh, just with the default tools that are available in Android Studio. So it's a very good idea to occasionally take a look at uh, how much memory, how much CPU your, CPU your application is using, and making sure that you haven't spiked any of those with some recent changes to your app. Uh, you can also use this to check network calls to make sure that you're not making more calls than you expect to be making. Uh, so uh, you can discover bugs quite easily here. APK size, very similar thing. If you keep checking this over releases, uh, then you can prevent it from bloating up. Uh, otherwise, as you're adding dependencies, as you're making your application larger and larger, you might end up with very large APKs. And I think that the numbers and the studies uh, that looked into this uh, show quite clearly that even just small increases in APK size will uh, start losing downloads for your app quite quickly. So don't assume that everyone has a ton of space and a ton of bandwidth. Um, and data available to just get your app. OK, uh, wrapping up with some development tooling um, in like two minutes. Uh, so version control should go without saying. Um, even if you're working alone, um, it's good to track your changes, being able to revert to earlier states, all of that. And if you have version control set up, then CI is just um, you know a kind of a simple uh, next step. We have lots of good options for CI uh, lately. And you can use this to uh, build your apps and run the tests that you might forget to run locally um, all the time as you're making changes to your code. 
And then with CD, you can also deploy uh, your built applications um, automatically, whether that's um, library deploy, for example, whether that's, uh, or uh, it can be the application going to beta channels or to the store directly. Then there's uh, crash reporting to think about. So after you've managed to release your application somehow, uh, you can uh, make sure that it's going well in actual production. So um, having crash reports, seeing if your users are having issues, what issues they're having, how many of them are affected is very handy. And it's quite easy to integrate. And then there's kind of the happy side of this, which is just regular analytics. So uh, adding usage analytics and seeing if your users are using specific features, if they're having success going through flows and completing those, uh, if you're gaining more users, um, stuff like that. Uh, that's also uh, something that you're supposed to be taking care of. And that's a good idea for your product. Finally, uh, one last mention. Um, there are, of course, alternative stores uh, to Google Play as well, even though we assume that that's the default one. Uh, things by Amazon, Samsung, or Huawei, for example. And especially if you're, you want to be there on all of, the, all of the Huawei devices that have App Gallery on them, uh, some of them are going to be devices that don't have Google services on there. So you might end up having to support a environment uh, on a device where Google services are not available. For example, you're not going to have Google Maps or Fuse Location or um, push notifications uh, through Google services. Um, so that's, again, if you have to support that or if you want to uh, get those users as well, that's even more complexity for you to handle. All right, uh, that's what I wanted to rush through today. So I had these two pitches about uh, either polishing a product uh, based on this or um, having a better idea for your next project uh, when you're planning it out. But really, the conclusion I want to get to here is that Android is super complex, and you really don't have to know everything about it. So you don't have to know every single API. Uh, you don't have to understand everything on the platform. And you also don't have to do all of these things for every single project. There are things where it's really just not worth writing UI tests or where you actually don't need analytics. Um, but you have to pick and choose your battles and make sure that you're doing these by choice and not just forgetting to do um, certain things. So with that, I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, if you want to grab the slides um, and things like that, uh, you can find them on the website. I'm also going to send this to the organizers. I just ran late with exporting them. So uh, I believe there's a common place to find them. So it's also going to be there. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, you can also do that. Um, I mostly tweet about Android and Kotlin things, uh, perhaps obviously. Um, and yeah, uh, that's a wrap for me. Uh, thank you very much for um, attending the talk and um, keep having a nice conference today. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let me click all the things. All right, so now we can see both of us. Um, so we are going to, again, take the Q&A on the Slack channel. Um, let me just add the banner quickly so that people um, know where to go. Uh, so thank you so much for the talk. That's like so much information packed into such a short talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, so we're going to take a quick two minute break. Just. Um...